Someone said, within crisis are the seeds of opportunity. If you don't have a spiritual practice in place, when times are good, you can't expect to suddenly develop one during a moment of crisis. Someone else said, a man has no more character than he can command than he can command in a time of crisis. How true it is. A while back, I introduced you to this young boy. His name's Silas. Many of you know him. His family used to fellowship here, then they moved back to Georgia. And, and a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, Silas was diagnosed with uh, cancer, stage four cancer. And and uh, those beads are known as beads of courage for the different medical treatments he's gone through and different things that has happened to him during his time of having cancer. And, and uh, we are reminded to pray for him, pray for his family. And uh, yesterday, Silas, uh, he went home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, pr- please pray for his family. But let me read this to you. A few days ago, his mom, Jessica, had posted this on his website that was dedicated to him. And she said, the night before last, Silas prayed this prayer. God, I'm ready for you to take me home. Please take me home now so that I can hurry up and get my new body so we can come back soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Jessica said, I asked him what he meant by so we can come back. He meant so he can come back with God to get everyone to take us to heaven. Last night we were watching music videos on YouTube before bed. We had just finished watching softly and tenderly Jesus is calling. And Silas said, okay, it's time to go. I said, go where? And he answered, tell God I'm ready to go home now. Then she writes, we can see his body declining. He's on oxygen constantly now. Again, we don't believe he has much time. Unlike last time we thought this, he has declined significantly since then and There are more signs now that his time on earth is coming to an end. Silas is ready to go home to heaven, to his real home. He has asked us to pray that God will take him home now. She writes, please join us in praying for God's perfect will and timing. Pray for Silas to have peace. Pray for our other three boys, Michael, Gideon, and Jason. Then she closes and says, may the Lord be glorified. I look at that and that what, what, what a challenge. And then yesterday, Silas goes home to be with the Lord. And, and that may the Lord be glorified is their prayer. That's tough. And I thought of this place where we are to David with the life of David and, and reminded of this quote I had already mentioned. A man has no more character than he can command at a time of crisis. And I think of Silas's mom and dad, Archie and Jessica, going through a crisis like that What do you have inside of you to sustain you? I can't imagine going through that with my children, watching them suffer. Jackie and I were talking about this the other day, knowing Silas was about ready to go home to be with the Lord and trying to walk it through from a parent's perspective. And quite frankly, I'm going to be honest with you, all right? I'm a pastor. I understand theology. I read my Bible. I understand why sickness and disease and death come into this world is because of the curse of sin. I understand that. But at the same time, there's some things I I do not understand. I can understand the theology of it, but it's hard for me to fathom a four-year-old boy going through that pain and suffering for so long. I I, I just don't get it. In my humanness, I I, I don't understand it. A 50-year-old man going through it is one thing, and then you see a four-year-old boy going through it, and mom and dad watching. I know he's home rejoicing with the Lord. I know he has a new, he's going to have that new body, and right now I know he's in no more pain or suffering for the former things that passed away. Man, is he rejoicing. I know that. But in the midst of it all, in the midst of the challenges, man, it's got to be tough. And life can be hard. And people go through these processes. Some of you have been through the processes. Some of you are in a process now. We call it character development. We'll get to that in a few minutes. It's it's tough. David is going through the character development stage today. When we left off with David, remember where we were. King Saul was dead, his arch enemy who had been trying to kill him. and, And to the north, remember, Israel at this time was split. 
David was ruling and reigning over the tribe of Judah only to the south. He was ruling and reigning in Hebron, but Israel was split, and there were 11 tribes that were to the north, and Ishbosheth was appointed by Abner, his commander, as king over the northern 11 tribes. And then Abner came to his senses last Sunday, we saw it. He came to his senses, he saw the light, you could say, and he defected from the kingdom of Saul and the kingdom of Ishbosheth, and he realized David is God's anointed. So he defected from the kingdom of Saul and the kingdom of Ishbosheth, Ishbosheth being the king in the north, and he defected to David's kingdom, and then he became an evangelist for David's kingdom. Remember that? He began to tell the people in the north, we saw this last Sunday, that David is the real king. He's God's anointed. Come and surrender to the kingdom of David. And when we left off last time, David and Abner, Abner who was once trying to kill David along with Saul, David and Abner were now joined in peace because Abner had saw the light. He left the kingdom of Ishbosheth and Saul came over to the kingdom of David. David forgave him. They departed as good friends. And in chapter 3 of 2 Samuel, the very last sentence of verse 21 says, So David sent Abner away. Abner, who was once an enemy. David sent Abner away, and Abner went in peace. So all looks good. There's still a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. But now Abner has joined David in the south. And Abner is telling everybody up north, hey, come join forces with David. David is the real king. Let's all 12 of us tribes get along. And and indeed, they are eventually going to get there. Soon enough, we'll see it. And now David and Abner are friends. But as it has been with David throughout his life, he does not have very many good days, does he? And today is no exception And right now, what do we come to? We come to, with David, the first crisis. Verse 22 tells us, after David sent Abner away, and Abner went in peace, at that moment, verse 22, the servants of David and Joab, remember, Joab was David's commander, they came from a raid, and they brought much spoil with them, but Abner was not with David in Hebron, For David had sent Abner away, and Abner had gone in peace. Verse 23, when Joab and all the troops that were with him had come, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he sent him away, and he has gone in peace. Verse 24, and then Joab came to the king, that be King David, and he said, David, what have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why is it that you sent him away and he is already gone? Verse 25, surely, David, you will realize that Abner, the son of Ner, he came to deceive you to know your going out and your coming in and to know all that you are doing. Well, let's stop here for just a minute so we can see how it's all setting up. Joab is upset with David. Why is Joab upset with David? Remember, Joab was David's right-hand man, and he still is David's right-hand man. Suddenly, from the northern kingdom, Abner comes into David and says, man, I'm sorry. And now Abner is like David's best new friend. And Joab's looking at it going, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Abner was a great warrior. Abner was Saul's former bodyguard and commander, and Ishbosheth's bodyguard and commander. And now Abner comes along the side of David, so we have a problem here. Joab is upset with David. He's saying, What's going on? How could you trust this, this Abner? Verse 25, he has come to deceive you. So this is what's happening. There's three different possibilities about why Joab is upset that David and Abner are now buddies and living in peace. Verse 25, Because genuinely, Joab is telling David, hey, Abner has come to deceive you. That's one possibility. That Joab is saying, David, I've got to protect you. Abner's a deceiver. The other possibility is this, that Joab is insecure. Joab is very concerned about his job. Because Abner was actually a better warrior than Joab was. And suddenly Abner and David are buddies. Uh Uh-oh, does that mean that Joab's going to be out of a job? Joab's going to get demoted from number two to number three, man. Uh Uh-oh, that could be part of it. Could be a little bit of jealousy and insecurity going on there. But there is another possibility, and in fact, it's not just a possibility. Regardless, it's possible that there's deception going on there. 
that, that Joab thought that was it, and there's insecurities on Joab's side. But ultimately, we know this, that there is a revenge factor here. Here's what's going on. Joab, we see the motive of his real intentions for being upset with David because Joab wants to exact revenge on Abner. Why is that? Remember, think back several weeks if you were with us that Sunday. Abner had accidentally killed Joab's brother. That is what's going on. So now Joab is in the picture, and Joab wants to purposefully kill Abner himself. Check it out. How do we know that? Look at this. Verse 26. And when Joab had gone from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner who brought him back from the well of Surah, but David did not know it. Now when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately, and there he stabbed him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. As we come to this passage, we recognize David's first crisis in this particular time. What do we come to? We come to this murder, this murderous act from Joab killing Abner, stabbing him in the stomach was an act of revenge. Jump over to verse 30. Tells us, so Joab and Abishai, his brother, they killed Abner because Abner had killed their brother Asahel at Gibeon in battle. Wow, quite intriguing to say the least. Now don't miss this because this is significant too. Abner had gone away. He's called back by Joab. David, we're just told, doesn't know anything about what's going on here. And then he's there. Abner's in the city of Hebron. And then check this out. He's in the city of Hebron, but in verse 27, it tells us, when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately, and then he stabs him. What's it mean he took him aside aside in the gate? It literally means he took Abner into the gateway. Well, what's the big deal about that, Pastor Tom? It's this. In Joshua chapter 20, verses 6 and 7, there are cities that were set aside that were known as a safe place, a city of refuge. What's the deal with that? If a person had accidentally killed another person, they could escape to that city of refuge and dwell there safely, and nobody could exact revenge upon the person who accidentally killed somebody else. Now remember, Abner had accidentally killed Joab's brother, right? But what are the cities of refuge? Well, in Joshua chapter 20, verse 7, the Bible tells us that Hebron was one of the cities of refuge. So when Joab, he tricks Abner to come aside in the gate, literally meaning in the gateway, what he did is he tricked Abner into coming just outside the official city gate into the gateway, not totally on the outside, but not totally on the inside, right, the in-between place. And while Abner is at the in-between place, he's no longer officially within the city gates, boom, he's dead. He's in the in-between place. Devastating. What does David do? Check it out. Verse 28, afterward, when David heard it, he said, My kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. In other words, David saying, listen, I didn't have anything to do with this. I didn't tell Joab to kill Abner. I am guiltless. I did not do that. He wants all Israel to know. Verse 29, he pronounces a curse. Look at this. Let this guilt rest on the head of Joab and on all of Joab's father's house, and let there never fail to be in the house of Joab one who has a discharge or one who is a leper or one who leans on a staff or falls by the sword or one who lacks bread. What's going on here? David pronounces a curse upon Joab. He's saying, Joab, he he tricks Abner into going into the in-between place, the the gateway to the city. He tricks him to come into that place, and while he's there, he kills him. I didn't know anything about it, and then David pronounces this curse on him. Now note this also. This is important. Joab was family of David. Joab was one of David's nephews by blood. 
David recognizes, you know what? He may be a family member of mine, but he has done evil, and I am going to separate myself from him. I, I was watching the news, as I'm sure most of you were, a few weeks back when that man was caught. He had the three girls that he had taken captive, and they've been captive uh, of his for years. And I saw an interview with the man's daughter, and she quite frankly said, I have nothing to do with my father. He is an evil man. What he's done is wicked. That's what David is saying here with Joab. What he's done is wrong. I have nothing to do with him. He is separating himself from Joab. Here's the scoop. Joab acted in revenge. Here's a quick statement to keep in mind. Choose the future over the moment. Choose the future over the moment. This is what happens. We get moved by our emotion, and we say, man, I've got to handle this situation like this. I've got to do this. I've got to do it right now. Count the consequences. Look one year down the road. Look two years down the road. Let's say I act revenge with, re with vengeance upon this situation. What is going to happen? Well, I can tell you this much. It really messed up Joab pretty bad. Over in 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 28 through 33, guess what happens? After David has died, David was king for 40 years. After David had died, Joab is now an old man. Guess what happens to Joab? Solomon is king, and guess what? Joab runs to the horns of the altar, aha, the place of refuge, for someone who has accidentally killed another person. But guess what? Joab did not accidentally kill Abner. He intentionally killed him. What does Solomon do? He says, grab Abner and execute him for the blood that he has shed over the innocent man Abner. Interesting, isn't it? Abner went to the place of refuge. Joab tricks him to come out. Joab goes to a place of refuge wrongly, says, uh-uh, that ain't going to work. You shed innocent blood 40 years ago, and now you're going to pay the price. Listen, years later, the consequences can come. Choose the future over the moment, whether it be revenge, whether it be temptation. You're in a position, you're thinking, oh, I'm tempted. I'll give in. Nobody will ever know. Really? Ask the man, ask the woman who's committed adultery against their spouse. Choose the future over the moment. So we have the murder. Note also we have the mourning. Verse 31. Then David said to Joab, And to all the people who were with him, Tear your clothes, gird yourselves with sackcloth, and mourn for Abner. And King David followed the coffin. So it's this time of mourning. So they buried Abner in Hebron, and they... And the king lifted up his voice, and he wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And the king sang a lament over Abner, saying, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet put into fetters. As a man falls before the, the wicked man, so you fell. Then all the people, they wept over him again. And when all the people, they came to persuade David to eat food while it was still day, day David took an oath, saying, God, do so to me, and more also if I taste bread or anything else until the sun goes down. So what's David doing here? David is mourning. He's mourning before all the people of Israel. The northern kingdom are witnessing what's going on. This is necessary. David had to convey that he did not kill Abner. He had nothing to do with it. If David was going to win the hearts of the 11 tribes to the north, man, David better be genuine in this, and he better not fake it because it's not going to work, and he's not faking it. This is genuine mourning, and, and, and here we read that he is even fasting. Verse 36, now all the people, they took note of it, and it pleased them, since whatever the king did, it pleased all the people. God is ministering to the people, drawing them, in their hearts to David. Verse 37, For all the people in all, in all Israel understood that day that it had not been the king's intent to kill Abner the son of Ner. And then the king said to his servants, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? And I am weak today, through, though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zariah. Who's Zariah? Zariah was David's sister. And David is saying, these men, they may be blood brothers. They're my nephews. They are too harsh for me, he says. The Lord shall repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. I look at all of that, and David's mourning, and, 
And, and, and I find this also fascinating. Let me bring up these three things before we go to the rest of it, all right? Note number one is this, and, and how well this all connects with this. Number one is this, we are flawed. Do you believe it? We are flawed. David was flawed. And, and you know what? I'm convinced that David was much more of a man of faith than any of us are. David had mess-ups. We saw a big mess-up last week with him, didn't we? He wasn't perfect. And neither are any of us. We are all flawed people. Now check this out. Joab, who David just pronounced a curse on, guess what? Joab never kicked him out of his, or David never kicked David, uh, Joab out of his kingdom. Joab continued to serve as David's right-hand man almost the entire 40 years of David's reign as king. Interesting, isn't it? He just placed his curse on him, but he never kicked him out of the kingdom. What do you see there? You see great grace. You see incredible grace grace. And I, and I look at this and I think, you and me, we are flawed. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, what grace we have. Jesus doesn't have to save our souls, does he? No, he, he doesn't. This isn't rocket science. He doesn't have to save our souls. But he did. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Number one, Jesus, number one we are flawed. Number two, Jesus is our refuge. As long as Abner stayed within the city gates of Hebron, he was safe. But when he went into the gateway of the city, when he went into the in-between place, the place of compromise, <clears throat> right? You and me, it's the same thing. Don't be lured away from Christ, your refuge. When you get into the gateway, when you get into the in-between in place, the place of compromise, you may not lose your salvation, but you will lose your safety, your joy, your satisfaction, and your protection. The thing with Abner is Abner was a fighter. Abner was one of the best fighters, if not the best fighters out of all of Israel, but because he stepped into the neutral zone, he was destroyed. Or the gateway, he was destroyed. But don't let this happen to you. Stay within the city of refuge under the shadow of the wings of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who promises to keep you, protect you, and guard you. Number three is where the people are, there are problems. <laughs> Believe it? Messes like this, really, they're going to happen. Let me show you, okay? Okay. Now, understand this is in the Bible, so I'm not making these words up, okay? Here it is. This is from Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14. What it says, without oxen, a stable stays clean, but you need a strong ox for a large harvest. Now, do you know what that means? <laughs> First service knew exactly what it meant when I put it up there. They started laughing when they, when I, when they read it. Here's the deal. No ox in the, in the stable. It's real simple. It means there are no manure droppings in the stable when there are no ox in the stable. See? When there's a harvest, you have lots of ox that have to go into the stable and then come out to help plow the fields. Right? So when you get the ox all together in a sanctuary, <laughs> you got it, right? This is what God is telling us. When you get people gathered together, even in the work of the Lord, and there is a great harvest, you can expect that there will be messes. David understood this and rightly deals with it. David will work with Joab throughout his reign, and he will bless all of Israel in the process. He had to balance Joab, he had to balance Israel, and he had to glorify God. In life, David understood that you go from one mess to the next, and that's just the way it is. But all in all, you do what you can, and you let the Lord sort it out. Amen? Now you know what that proverb means. Number two, and lastly, only two main points today. We move from the first crisis to the second crisis. Chapter four, 
It says, when Saul's son, that would be Ishbosheth, remember, he's the king over the 11 tribes in the north. He heard that Abner had died in Hebron. Ishbosheth, the king of the northern tribes, lost heart, and all Israel was troubled. Why is that? Who's going to protect him? Is David now going to come and kill us all? That's what they're worried about. Verse 2, now Saul's son had two men who were captains of his troop. The name of one was Bana or something like Banana or whatever it says there. And the name of the other was Rechab, the sons of Rimon the Beerthite of the children of Benjamin. In parentheses for Beerthite, Beeroth was also a part of Benjamin because the Beerthites fled to Gidim and have been sojourners there until this day. Now verse 4 is an interesting verse. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. In other words, Saul's grandson. And he was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan had come from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and he became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Now let me stop here. I'm going to say this. I do not know why verse 4 is suddenly entered into the narrative of chapter 4 here. It, it, it doesn't seem to fit, but God has it here. But my guess is that it's for a great encouragement. Mephibosheth, the little boy who's five years old, who was dropped and his feet became lame, he remains lame all the days of his life. But his life story doesn't come up until several chapters later. My only guess is it's here, it's inserted in verse 4, just as a reminder or as a, a word of knowledge that coming in the weeks ahead is one of the most encouraging stories and most encouraging passages, most encouraging biblical principles throughout the entire Bible, apart from being saved by the grace of Christ. When we look at this man, Mephibosheth, lame, at five years old, we are going to see grace like you've never seen it before. And I got a hunch that every one of us are lame at something. And man, let me tell you, it is encouraging, but that's still a few weeks off in the future when we come to the life of Mephibosheth. Verse 5 continues with the narrative. And then the sons of Rimon, the Beerthite, Rechab, and Bana set out and came at about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth. Remember Ishbosheth, the king of the north, who was lying on his bed at noon. And they came there all the way into the house as though to get wheat, and they stabbed Ishbosheth in the stomach. Yuck. And then Rechab and Bana, his brother, they escaped. Verse 7, for when they came into the house, he was lying on his bed in his bedroom. And then they struck him and they killed him. Look at this. And they beheaded him and they took his head and were all night escaping through the plain. Wow. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David of Hebron and said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. And the Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, the stay of Saul, and his descendants. You know what I say? That's so gross, is it not? What do we have here? We have the treachery. You look at this. Ishbosheth's the king of the north. He's supposed to have these two men who should at least be bodyguards. But what are they doing? They go and they kill him. And they cut off his head. They take it to David. And they say, aha, David's going to give us kudos. woo we killed, we killed Ishbosheth, Saul's son. It's not going to go well for these two boys. We see the treachery. And we find out it's a travesty. Verse 9. But David, he answered, Rachab and Ambana, his brother, the sons of Rimon, the Beerthite, and he said to them, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all adversity, when someone told me, saying, Look, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good news, I arrested him and had him executed in Ziklag, the one who thought I would give him a reward for his news. How much more, verse 11, when wicked men have killed a righteous person in his own house, on his own bed while he's asleep. Therefore shall I not now require his blood at your hand and remove you from the earth. Verse 12, so David commanded his young men and they executed them. And look at this. They cut off their hands and feet and hanged them by the pool in Hebron, but they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner in Hebron. I look at this and just go, my, my, my. The treachery and the, tra the travesty. It is indeed, it's gross. Here's the deal. David had two big crisis situations. He had the situation with Abner being murdered. He had the situation with Ishbosheth being murdered. The two leaders of the north, 
David had to do what was right, and he had to do it quickly. If he did not do what was right and do it quickly, he would have lost the trust of all the 11 northern tribes. But he acted in the crisis rightly. He did what was right. He did what was necessary. We might not like it. We might say all this blood and all this stuff. David did what was necessary. But up to this point in David's life, There's some good lessons for you and I, and I'm going to close with three of them, all right? As we put all of these things together, we've been with David, gosh, for many years in a sense, throughout his life, but note these three things, all right? Number one is this, God doesn't work according to our timetable. Has anyone ever noticed that? David was promised the kingdom years before, 20 years by the measurement of some Bible scholars, and through the years he was harassed by Saul. He is chased by Abner. He is forced to live with the Philistines. He suffered anguish and extreme testings. And when David then, he comes to Hebron, he's only anointed king over the southern kingdom of Judah, but not all of the 11 tribes of the northern kingdom. And now while he's here, he has to do, deal with two difficult crisis situations. David, here's the deal, he was promised the kingdom, but God never promised him that it would be easy or that it would come quickly. As high as the heavens are above the earth, the prophet Isaiah wrote, so are God's thoughts above our thoughts, so are God's ways above our ways. The apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, who began a good work in you, he will be faithful to complete it. Indeed, he will. But here's the deal. He does not promise it will be quick. In fact, the completed work will take a lifetime. He does not promise it will be easy. In fact, it won't. There will be times where it will be easy, and there will be times where there will be very difficult trials. But all along the way, we are reminded, Romans chapter 8, all things work together for good for who? For those who love God, right, and those who are called according to his purpose. All things. What's that mean? The good things and the bad things. In Romans 8, verse 29, that we are being conformed through all things working for our good. We are being conformed, here's the purpose, into the image of his dear son. I do not understand in my finite mind, Archie and Jessica And the little boy, Silas, four years old, suffering and suffering and suffering, and then he goes home to be with the Lord. In my finite mind, it does not make sense. But I know this. All things work together for good. And we are all being conformed into the image of of God's Son. And ultimately, this, this life is over. Ultimately, we go into eternity with Christ or without Christ. molding us into the image of his son. Number two, God sends hard times because we need them in order to grow. God had a purpose in making David fight. He had to fight all his life. Remember he fought Goliath when he got started? (laughs) David's been fighting all his life. God had a purpose in making David fight for what God had promised. God promises you things to fight for. What's the purpose? We've already talked about character development. Anybody there? (laughs) If you're not, you will be. Joseph, character development. Daniel, character development. The Apostle Paul, character development. David, character development. You and me, character development. Archie, Jessica. There are other three sons. Character development even when we don't get it. Molding us into the image of his son. Lastly, trusting God in God during the good times and the difficult times is necessary. Let me read this to you. R- Ray Stedman, a pastor who died several years ago, wrote this a while back, before he died, obviously. And he writes... <laughs> I am such a rocket scientist sometimes. (laughs) Recently, I received a letter from two missionaries in Guatemala, Ron and Gretchen Bruno. This is just the craziest thing. Gretchen wrote, 
of an incident that had encouraged her greatly. A poor widow at one of the congregations in Guatemala was down to her last 20 cents and without food, and she began to pray about her problem. And as she was praying, she felt a deep conviction that God was telling her to go to the large supermarket in town the next day and fill up several carts with groceries and take them to check out stand number seven. And this was not just a vague feeling on her part, but a deep spirit-born conviction. So she went down to the supermarket the next morning, loaded enough groceries into the carts to last two or three months, and she took them to check out stand number seven. And just as she got there, the cashier closed the stand to go for lunch. She suggested that the woman take her groceries to another stand, but the woman said, no, I cannot. My father in heaven has told me to take these through stand number seven. I can imagine what the clerk was thinking. (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) So she waited until the clerk came back from lunch, and the clerk was surprised to see the woman still there, but started to check out her groceries. And just then, an announcement came over the loudspeaker. Since this is our seventh year of business, we are pleased to announce that whoever is checking out at check stand number seven will receive free groceries. Look at that thing. (laughs) You know, just. I uh, give it a whirl. (laughs) Give it a whirl. (laughs) See see how it goes for you. Someone said, faith is believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. That's what David did. He acted accordingly. He didn't rush things along. He, he allowed God to do things. Believing in advance what's only going to make sense in reverse. But the bottom line with all of this, is real, it really comes down to this. What we have here is sin. We have lying, cheating, murder. We've seen all kinds of horrific acts. And we also see grace. And ultimately, we know that through the lineage of David came the one who was greater than David centuries later, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who comes to us liars and cheaters and murderers and thieves and everybody else, that whosoever believes in him and repents of their sin will not perish but have everlasting life for the repenting of the sin and the asking of forgiveness. Pretty good deal, isn't it? He takes our sin and we get his forgiveness. He takes our hell, we get his heaven, simply for the repenting, to change your mind about sin and surrender to him.